How are you doing today, Gary? Doing very well and, and happy to be with you and, and your audience and uh, looking forward to the conversation today. And I think if we do our job right, not only will we make what we're talking about interesting, but I think raise a few eyebrows. And I think that's what we really need to do. We need to do it in a way that sort of role models who we are and what we believe. But to get people's attention, we need to talk you know, about things that you're not going to hear on in most media. That's for sure. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Absolutely. I heard one of your podcasts on the confessionals with Tony Merkel, and it was an amazing study that you did. And at the end of the study, Tony asked you, he said, you know, having all this information, having this knowledge, how do we combat darkness? And man, your reply that you said was to so seeds and sowing seeds and that's what i wanted to ask you today is could you expound upon that maybe a little bit more how do we sow seeds and what does that look like you know yeah so i think um we want to understand the world that we live in and from that we can decide what that metaphor sort of means how do we plant seeds um, it's physical and interactive as well, but it's also allegorical and uh, and certainly not that we're trying to uh, look at ourselves as Jesus uh, who planted all the good seed and Satan who planted all of the evil seed. But as Christians, we can plant seeds. But the first thing that we need to do first is to completely understand that this rule, this world is not ruled by Jesus today. It's not ruled by God today, and and the Holy Spirit is active, but it's not ruling in this world today. Today, the world is run by Satan, who's the archon of this world, and the prince of this world, and the god of this world for a little while longer. And he's in charge of all of the hierarchy, both visible and invisible. So he controls all of the Hebrew Saba army of angels underneath him through the council of the gods and the hierarchy that he established with the invisible ones in Psalms 82 over the 70 nations, Deuteronomy 32. And he also authorizes through his council of the gods the divine right to rule for the spurious offspring of the fallen angels or the celestial mafia godfathers, as I like to call them. And mm -hmm. so the ones who rule this world as the visible ones and that hierarchy of beings, both descendants and other creations of the fallen ones uh, are, and, and we know that biblically as the elementals that enslave us in the New Testament. Uh, just mm -hmm. for to make a quick sort of biblical reference and not to get too far down, up down the path on it. But I just wanted to lay that down is, is we live in this world that's controlled by all of the dark forces who are trying to make sure we don't find God or find our way back to God. In fact, they want to lead us away from God and to honor the pantheon of the gods. So everything that they do, including all of the sciences and the seven sacred sciences that were created by Enoch, son of Cain, uh, from the knowledge you learned from Adam, according to the Gnostics, that merged with the ancient angelic knowledge before the flood. The four goals were to lead people away from God, number one, just as Cain 
never forgave God for his ostracization. And Enoch was his father's son. And there are two Enochs, so don't get confused with Enoch, son of Jared. And it's another important sort of doctrine as we understand how to plant seeds we need to we need to understand the bible thoroughly so that we can communicate clearly and the second thing is is they wanted to not give god credit for anything to like degrade them as this as the second thing and to slander him and they use humans to do it fallen angels don't do that <laughs> they use their spirits offspring and humans and their religions to slander god they're too smart to slander god they know how powerful he is and the fourth thing is to honor the pantheon of gods and they do that in everything they do they name everything in the sciences after the gods and all the imagery is after the polytheist religion so if we understand that that's what we're up against uh that the biggest thing that they want us to do is is to not believe in god so they control all the governments all of the education all the media all the science everything except each individual and so they don't want us to exercise our free choice and so they need to prepare us and they need to brainwash us so that's the challenge so those of us who have accepted christ we need to plant seeds in this very very dark world and hope that those seeds will grow and we do that first of all by role modeling and so we want to be good role models. So why would somebody convert to be a Christian if we're bad role models? And we, the second seed we want to be planting in terms of how we communicate is, is we know not everybody's going to um, convert. And we're there to help. That's what Christians did. That's why Christians, Christianity became so popular. They were the lowest of the Roman society, but they were the first to help in time of disease and time of need. They role modeled and they showed their values in what they did. And so we need to be understanding of the world we need to understand that people have been programmed not to believe in god we ought not to be looking down on them we ought not to be lecturing them we're there to provide information and the good things and that maybe that they would want to have a look we want to be seen in the world not being this apocalyptic cult that we're here to help people ensure that they understand a simple concept. And that concept is written in the book of life. And the book of life was created before creation. And all beings in this allotted period of time have had their names written in this book of life. And everyone in that book of life will have this opportunity to leave that name in the book of life or have it blotted out. We want people to know that whatever goes on in this world, the thing that you are in control of is what you do. And you are in control of your destiny. If you choose Christ. Now we also want to plant a seed with people to say that the other side, and there's basically two sides. If you're secular agnostic, you are part of the polytheist side. Uh, those concepts are polytheist doctrines, and they're, they're used to lead people away from God. So we want people to, to, to understand that they look at themselves because they've been deluded by the fallen angels, that they can win freedom against this evil God of the Bible that they like to talk about and slander, that they uh, are the children of light and... Christians are the evil ones. And we need to understand that, that when we're talking to them, that we don't fulfill their preconceived brainwashed ideas. And we want to have them ask hard, critical questions about what they believe and also ask us hard, critical questions about what we believe. And we have to be able to answer that. So if you're going to be planting seeds you'll have to know the principles of the bible for sure but you also have to know the history and the future 
And you have to know everything in between there because they have been trained to ask questions Christians can't answer because Christians generally only read parts of the Bible that they're told to read in church uh, Sunday schools and church um you know, sessions. So whether it's mass or it's just at a, at a, a Protestant church, I mean, it is, you get a couple of verses every week and everybody goes home and said, we know the Bible. Well, you don't know the context until you know the Bible and all of the context. And the other seed that we want to do is we want to teach not only Christians, but also uh, we want to teach non-Christians that if you want to understand why things are happening today and what's going to happen in the future, you have to understand prehistory because as Ecclesiastics teaches us, and we can remind them that polytheism has a similar concept, nothing new is under the sun. What was will be again. And the understanding of that, as that passage continues in Ecclesiastics ones is the understanding of that brings only grief and sorrow. So, when we understand the Bible teaches about giants and angelic rebellions and destructions of the world and flood, uh, and that we've seen perpetual war, not only before the flood, again, after the flood, this cycle continues. So when our Messiah, our Redeemer says it's going to be like the days of Noah in the time of his coming, we better understand what happened because we have to plant the seed with everybody that we can't imagine what's coming unless we understand where we came from. And that's going to get into topics that is going to create a lot of cognizant dissonance for people and that we need to be able to prepare ourselves for what is coming so that we can hold up with our testimony when those unimaginable things start to happen so that we can continue to be that role model. So those are the kinds of seeds, is, is how do we plant seeds of ideas in people's heads, in concepts, as to, I want to be like them. I don't want to be like this world. And we need to understand that they don't know that this world as it is, is not our natural home. And that heaven is our natural home because that's where our spirit comes from. And the world to come is going to not only harness our spirit, but also our oikotarian or our soul and our body. That's going to be a new body like Jesus's body that was resurrected. So uh, we need people to, to understand that you, you want to be not part of this world, even though we're going to have to interact with it, but we have to be spiritually as much as we can, uh, protecting ourselves from this world with the armor of God. And that takes the notion of the last seed. You have to know the Bible. There's this new doctrine that's out. That's basically saying that Jesus already returned and, you know, the millennium's passed. And like a lot of the architecture in our world today is a, a byproduct of the millennium. And, you know, I sort of wanted to talk about this for a minute because this uh, doctrine is catching a lot of momentum. And I really wanted to see where you weigh in on this. Is this prehistory? Is this us not understanding uh, Nephilim prehistory and we're confusing it with the millennium? What is your take on that millennium uh, doctrine that's out right now? Yeah, it is a uh, kind of a Tartarian take on preterism and there's many different types of preterism as you get into eschatology um, and they all have a lot of similarities but they have some nuances to it and this one is uh, particularly creative i think in its nuances i don't tend to agree with it but i i do <laughs> i do respect the uh um the uh as i say the um the imagination that they had to to come up with this no so people aren't going to be all that happy that i said that but there are many types of eschatological approaches and the problems with eschatological 
you know, prophetic approaches for people not familiar with eschatology as, as a word. Um, there are many different kinds, and the problem with them is that they have preconceived conclusions, and then they try and fit the Bible uh, into that. And what happens is they have to twist a lot of scripture and manipulate scripture, reinvent scripture, discount what Jesus said, reinvent what Jesus said, or ignore inconvenient passages to get there. So one of the things that um, we want to be careful of is one of the signature sort of passages that um, they are focusing on is Revelation 20 in this term little season right and in that understanding for people who aren't aware of it what they've said is this is the period of the little season when satan has been released after the thousand year reign of christ who's still reigning in jerusalem at this point in time that they don't mention <laughs> um and satan is going to gather an army and attack the ruling uh messiah at jerusalem that they like to ignore and they say this has been going on in this little season and they reinvent little season to mean hundreds of years some people thousands of years there's many sort of nuances to that and you have to look at the words for how they're used in the bible and sometimes we need to look at the original greek word for the old testament and hebrew word for 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 the uh, new for the old testament and greek for the new testament so that word little season is the same phrase that is used one other time in the Bible, also in the book of Revelation. And that's in Revelation 6, where you have the martyred saints for the testimony of Jesus that are surrounding the throne and have been resurrected as part of the first fruits resurrection, are told to wait for a little season, using the King James Version equivalent, wording that's being used uh, in this little season used for this Tartarian preterism. Um, and that is going to be three and a half years that they're wow. going to wait for the fulfillment of that little season. So if we just use that, we could say, well, that doesn't make 200 years. That doesn't make thousands of years. It's three and a half years. And even if, the time of Armageddon, in the time of the Bullrats, when Antichrist is uh, is assembling at Mount Hermon for Armageddon, and demons go out of the mouth of the Antichrist, go out of the mouth of Satan, go out of the mouth of false prophet to gather the nations to the world, that takes less than a year. And you have a similar application for this little period that happens in Revelation 17 when you have the ten kings hand their power over to Antichrist and it becomes, and that's not thousands of years. That that happens within six months. And so typically a season is understood as three months. Um, but understand it could be allegorical, which is the preterist approach here. It is, is to create an allegory there. But mm -hmm. We don't have an example of that uh, where you can expand it to this period of time. But if you take it back to Greek, you have a little, which is the word micros, which is Greek and like in microscopic. That's where micro and microscopic would come from. Small, little, not large, little. There's no meaning to it that is going to be part of it. And season is chronos. And again, it has a little bit more of uh, uh, derivatives in, it, in its meanings, and you have to pick the right passage or the meaning for that passage, especially when you have little there, as in micros, that's specifying a short period, right? Small. Um, but chronos is uh, a space of time in general, um, not always defined. 
and it's a fixed or a special occasion in another meaning, as in fix, fix, fix festivals within those seasons uh, from, from the Old Testament sort of application. And that would be a yearly sort of basis in that season or three months as a season, as we would understand it, as it's also used in the New Testament. Um, so we don't really get from the definition and the two words either in English or Greek, where you get thousands of years. You have to reinvent that what it says and not to believe what your eyes are saying there. But I kind of like to um, take things a little bit further, uh, just mm -hmm. so that people know that um, there's, there's, yeah, and you can't ignore inconvenient passages or, or pass, you know, verses. And so when we look at uh, applications of this, we get passages in the, uh, in the New Testament where it's going to use uh, another word that will make that, that time period larger. So you'll have that accompanying word that is going to... Um, that is going to be there along with the word season or chronos. And it's going to say it's a longer period of time. And you're going to get that in the clear sort of um, uh, denunciations. So uh, you could look at passages um, uh, in, in the book of Acts, uh, for example, um, that is going to describe that. And people want to get a hold of me. I won't go through each passage. Get a hold of me. I'll, I'll send you those passages. Um, I, you know, I just want to make sure that um, people know that I, I'm not making sort of things up. So the other thing that I want to underline here is, is Revelation is written in a very interesting sort of way. It's, it uses and all the way through to introduce events. And so you have and going all the way through Revelation 20, and this happens and this happens and this happens. And that's the Greek word kahi. And uh, it basically is used to mean the when. It can also mean a few other things, but it's used as then this happens and then this happens. And so you have these events that are being described in Revelation 20 that happen immediately after the start of the millennium. And then once the thousand years are in place. And this is the same word that's used throughout revelation for every new kind of event that's going to take place and that doesn't and it, although those events don't happen like thousands of years apart um so and and they don't even try and make that case because it, it, would, it would it would start to sort of fall apart and it's a very similar word that jesus uses in his chronology and he uses the word tota in greek and that's the word then, and that's the when. So when he gives us his chronology, you, you know, it's translated as then, and it's tota, and it's the same application as kahi is in, in the book of Revelation. And that this is the testimony, the book of Revelation is the testimony of Jesus Christ given to the angel to show John. It has to fit. It has to match up perfectly. And uh, we don't get any of that in Jesus' chronology. And in Revelation, he rules immediately after the last seven years. They rule for a thousand years. Then they release Satan, and then Satan makes war on them. And then we move into eternity and, 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 the, and the final judgment. So that's just the start of how the Bible is being manipulated to create this illusion to fit a preconceived conclusion. But it doesn't say that. We don't even get backup passages to support that in the Bible. And of course, their answer is, is, well, that's because it's all been destroyed. Well, then why wasn't all of the Bible destroyed? Why would we have these things left over to challenge this type of, uh, of eschatological approach? So I have a 10-point set of disciplines I use when when I, I do research and prophecy and those are a couple of those points is that I put in there is is don't don't reimagine passages 
Um, mm -hmm. And if you're going to use Greek and Hebrew, pick the proper translation for that passage, and you can't have any conflicts throughout the Bible. So it has to fit perfectly because it's the Word of God. And when you get into preconceived eschatology, you get conflicts. When you put everything around what Jesus said and not vice versa, all the conflicts go away. Wow. Wow, man. Thank you. Is there any way I could ask you, Gary, Is could you share those 10 points with us or is that for another time? So absolutely we can do that. Yeah, and that'd be awesome. You know, I'm just going <laughs> to, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, they're quite simple, but it, what it does do is, is it provides um, your borders in terms of what you're doing in your research as a, as a Christian. So um and it's a tough standard so it's not easy to do so first one is is i read the bible literally including revelation mm. and so anytime you see an interpretive approach that's polytheism that's their fundamental doctrine everything is coded in allegories and mysteries, and you have to be an adept, uh, educated in certain knowledge to be able to understand anything that they're writing about. And the mundane won't understand what they're talking about, which they view Christians as mundane. So, um, so when they look at the Bible, they reinvent it. That's the Gnostic incursions into Christianity. So I define the allegories from within the Bible. So that's why when I talk about... Um, and, and it's one of my points is, is to understand prophecy and under, need to understand prehistory. So that's point number three. And so if you want to understand Babylon, you have to understand what Babylon was not only before the flood, but after the flood. And it's rooted in the Hebrew word Babel. And the Babel is the restart of Enochian mysticism, Enoch, son of Cain, after the flood. And even the word Babylon, from a Hebrew perspective, uh, from the beast empire of Babylon, is rooted in the Hebrew word Babel, from a Hebrew perspective. So if you want to un understand who, um, the, you know, the, the beast empires, you have to understand prehistory and uh, understand that there's a two more beast empires to come in the end time. And so that's point number three is that understanding uh, prophecy. You need to understand prehistory and there's dual prophecies. And, and in the Bible that gives you, give you terrific information on prehistory. It's a prophecy for the time of the prophet. And then there are prophecies that aren't fulfilled until the end time. Revelation is partly that way with all that information around the throne and prehistory. Um, and it's also a vision prophecy as well, like what Daniel would have had and some other prophets. And there's different kinds of prophecies. I kind of break them down that way. But point number four is, is I read the Bible in a linear manner. So it begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. And that tells a complete story. It doesn't change in the last chapter. <laughs> it's a complete story, right? Right. <laughs> or the last couple of chapters. Um, and so where some of the passages, or, or I mean, some of the books seemingly aren't in chronological order, let's say like the Book of the Prophets, for example, mm -hmm. You, you have markers that are put in there in terms of the kings that were ruling, and then you can go and fit that prophet and his prophecies within there. So, And the book of Revelation, if you put that over top of Jesus' template in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21, you see the chrono chronological order of it. You just have to look at the churches as being part it and that's why it's partly you know that dual prophecies is you have those letters being delivered by john to the six churches and some of the promises deliver that are promised to the churches don't happen in the time of those churches but they will in the end time like the 10 years of of uh, tribulation in in revelation 2:10, uh for example um and so i read it in a linear manner and it just begins in Genesis, it ends in Revelation, 
for this particular age for us. And we're going to move on to a new age and a new earth and a new heavens at the end of that. So the next one is number five is, is I try to include all relevant passages on a prophecy subject or a narrative or a prophecy doctrine or a doctrine in the Bible uh, together to have a complete understanding of the doctrine or uh, chronological events. And that's tough to do. And you have to be prepared that if you put your um, prophecy chronology in place and you run across a passage that is diametrically opposed or not fitting properly, you've done something wrong. You have to handle it. You have to have an approach that can adapt. And once I, I had the aha a moment with with this is, is I never had to worry about if I missed a passage, it just fit. It just always right. fit after that. So, um, so I do not leave out number six. I don't leave out inconvenient passages. And what do you mean by um, inconvenient? Like and, something that doesn't line up or. Yeah. So like if you, you know, if you're looking at um, a passage that might suggest that uh, Jesus is coming back, after the abomination, as with his sign in Matthew 24, understanding that that's a chronological order and defined by the Greek word toda, then for the sequential unfolding of the events and a, and a midtime marker, and his sign is there, and you're trying to promote after the millennium, during the millennium that he comes, or before the tribulation, then um, you need to have another look at that. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you have you go into reinventing what it says. You have, you have to handle that. It, and if you can't, then you got, you got two choices. You're either going to throw everything out. You're going to say the Bible is in conflict. Or maybe we just should use Jesus' chronology as, it, as, he's, as he's laid it out. Yeah. And uh, number uh, seven is, as I apply all prophecies of the Old Testament labeled to Judah to the Southern Kingdom. Okay. And all prophecies to Israel to the Northern Kingdom. And I do not subscribe that people say that those are Christian prophecies. They, they are going to be bought brought back into the covenant and that happens through the use of understanding how you apply old testament prophecies to judah and to israel and if it's to a specific tribe like ephraim you apply it specifically to that tribe of ephraim and again not to the church the new testament has prophecies for the church the old testament is of the original covenant and the prophets thereof they all deal in the end time there's a parallel track that's working to bring the bride in place before armageddon but you can't confuse uh, uh judah and israel and you can't confuse israel and judah with the church in terms of prophecies you have to keep them separate and people will say, well, Jesus was talking to the elect of, 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 uh, of, of Judah at that time in Israel, except that he wasn't necessarily just talking to Judah. Was he talking to them? Sure. But we're also told in the New Testament something like 25 times or so um, that um, the elect applies to Christians as well of the new covenant. So when he's going to gather his elect to heaven, is in Mark's uh, detail at the time of the sign and the last trumpet. That's a physical rapture to, to heaven. That's not going to be Judah and Israel because they have their own reconciliation that happens in the second exodus uh, and the bringing together of that rod. So that's why it's important to understand that. It happens in the three and a half years and part of Jesus' visit as in Hosea 9-7, um, or the days of the Son of Man, as, as uh, the book of Luke talks about. Number eight, eight, prophecies as they apply, by all prophecies assigned to the tribes of Dan, Ephraim, and Manasseh. I already covered that one. Number nine, apply, I place all passages um, on prophecy or doctrine or information provided in the, in the Bible around what Jesus said, not vice versa. So mm. if you're going to look at 2 Thessalonians, uh, you know, 2, 
place that around Jesus' chronology, it'll fit perfectly, but you don't place what Jesus said around Paul's chronology. You place what Jeremiah said around what Jesus said, not vice versa. He's the word of God. He's the spirit of prophecy. That's who provided the prophecy to the prophets. It's not going to be in conflict with what Jesus said. It, he is the defining factor. And he's the spirit of prophecy as the word of God. So, And the final one is, is I believe Jesus is the authority on prophecy and everything written in the Bible is the Alpha Omega and the spirit of prophecy as in Revelation 19.10 and the word of God as in Revelation 19.13 and John 1, 3, and 14. And so Amen. it's... What was number two again, quite, Gary? I missed that one. Oh, okay. Um, I define all allegories from within the Bible, okay. not outside the Bible. And that includes Revelation. So if you want to understand um, who the uh the the beast is you want to understand who antichrist is you want to understand um what that monster is that comes up out of the sea uh what's coming out of uh, the abyss prison don't go outside the bible it's all there inside the bible and it'll okay. define in all of those um uh, allegorical what people would say is they, they i mean that's why people have a tough time believing it says well i mean how can these things actually be well you just have to dig into the bible and you're going to get your answers but understand that that word sarah trouble is the cognate word for the timing as in the great tribulation or the greek word philipses which means not wrath <laughs> as people like to reinvent it, different word, orge and thumos used in, in the in the Greek test or the Greek New Testament versus the word used in, in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and two different sets of events. And this great tribulation is the great tribulation not seen since the beginning of creation. Like this is the time of Jacob's trouble that he saved out, out of. And the tribulation of the saints happens in the first three and a half years and we get that word philipses used in uh, matthew 24 7 to 8 uh where the, is, the word is affliction and mm -hmm. it should be translated as tribulation but people will use that and say well that's not the tribulation and then they point to the great tribulation in matthew 24 21 and that's a different tribulation and how do we know that is because um it happens after the abomination versus the affliction before and then when you go to the mark's account and he talks about this great uh, destruction that's going to happen and, and terrible times not seen since the beginning of creation the translation is affliction from the same greek word thalipses <laughs> and so this translated differently in the exact same reference and that is a different affliction that is happening in matthew 24 7 to 8 so and that's the revelation seven saints that are going to be martyred for their testimony in those first three and a half years um, yeah. and they're part of the first fruits a resurrection that is completed with the final first fruits which is the hundred forty four thousand called first fruits and shown in heaven in revelation 14 and then you get the summary of the last three and a half years after that and after the gospel has been preached by the angel and the 144,000 and the two witnesses. <laughs> man, Gary, you're hitting on a lot of points today. This is incredible, man. I sort of want to shift gears and, and cover yet another arena here, too. What is the root origin of Odinism and Norse demonology? Where does it stem from? How do we break it down? And how do we target praying against these spiritual entities in prayer? Sure. So Odin is the chief god of the Norse pantheon. Uh, he would be equivalent to Wotan in Germany. He would be, and it's the same god because it's the same Germanic uh, version, uh, same god as Zeus, the same god as Baal, the same god as Osiris, just a different vernacular name for the same god. And he is a horn god. Right, like as you would know, coming out of Druidism, Hern or Cernunos mm -hmm. are horn gods and nature gods, and Odin is of the hunt, just as those other gods are. 
And so when you're looking at Hearn and Cernunos, that's a reflection not of necessarily Odin, but the parent god. Um, it, or it's a name that the original Nephilim and Raphaim called uh, Odin. Um, and when you take that back to Indo-Aryan, which is the language of the giants, both before and after the flood, um, in, in, in Indo-Aryan or Indo-European, uh, CERN means horned and a similar spelling word to CERN or Kern can be pronounced K or C and it's transliterated both ways around the world, um, would be horned and head. So a head with horns. And so you actually get a Etruscan god that we kind of known as Inuus after the flood, uh, who is known as, as CERN, which is the short version of Cernunos, which can mean uh, Cernunos as, as, as of the oaks, or it can be, or his house, or it can be as a king or a god, as, as the suffix. And the CERN out of the Etruscan um, language in, in Pantheon, uh, that name came down through the Romans, as we understand it, as Innus, and very similar to Bacchus or Dionysus or Pan or Sternunos, again, of the nature gods, and is one of these double goat gods, one of these degraded seraphims after the flood as they become transformed into, as Azazel is understood as, as the goat god. So it would be equivalent to Azazel as being before the flood, but these are offspring gods that take over after the flood. And they're going to be degraded as well for the same crimes, which is why we, we get their personas, not as seraphim, serpent-faced angels, but as these degraded horn gods. And uh, the horn is very, very important to understand that they're, you also use that in another allegory in polytheism as bulls. So as in the bull cult, both before and after the flood. So like Molech is the bull cult, Baal has a bull cult. And the gods were understood as bulls and their spurious offspring are bulls. These are the bulls of Bashan that are taunting Jesus on the cross that the book of Psalms talks about. Oh, yeah, it's all 22, and, yeah. Yeah, these are the same understandings. We just have to separate the allegories and how they're used for gods before the flood and gods after the flood. And so typically what we, we so we don't get Zeus as the most common, uh, we don't get, yeah, we get Zeus as the most common Greek god, for example, and Baal as the Canaanite god. But the parent god that ruled before the flood was Kronos. Zeus takes over. And in polytheism, they murdered the parent gods. Well, they didn't murder them. They can't kill an immortal. Only that's possible. Only God can do that. They went to the pit prison for their crimes. And then after the flood, those offspring gods, after they committed the same crimes again, and sometime probably just after Babel, also go to the pit prison. And they disappear and people, and that's why they're trying to bring them back all of the time. Um, but they're not coming back until the abyss is opened in, in Revelation 9, just before the midpoint of the last seven years. So we need to understand that this is the religion of the giants. Mm. And these are the gods and the pantheon of the giants. And that humans, after Babel, went and moved in amongst these giants and accepted those polytheist religions and intermarried with them. And this is the old religion. This is the old Babel religion that was part of all the societies of the world. It just has a different vernacular flavor. It has the same gods, just with different vernacular names, same type of rituals. And that the Norse were Tuatha de Danan, or as they're called in the Ugaritic text, the, the tribes of Datanu, or in Sumeria, Tuatha Danu, in other words, the tribe of Anu, same names, different types of transliterations all over the world. You have the blonde hair, blue eyed Tuatha de Danan in Norse mythology, and Tuatha de Danan as the red haired. Hazel-eyed variety as the predom most predominant ones over in Ireland and England. And the Picts, even in Scotland, are another division of the Tuatha de Danann, <laughs> uh, just a different sect of them. And so 
Um, this is all that ancient religion, and there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same rituals that have been practiced ever since the beginning of the flood, and they're inherited from knowledge passed on and saved um, by the antediluvians and by the fallen angels who provide that knowledge to humans and to their spirit's offspring after the flood. Wow. Wow. Thank you for breaking that down. I have, I have an off the wall question. I've been wanting to ask you for months, bro. Um, I want to know what are your thoughts on that being Sasquatch, that creature? And uh, yeah, what, what, what's your take on Bigfoot? <laughs> Well, it's interesting because it's it's uh, not just a modern mythology. It's an ancient mythos. It has a mythos that has been with us throughout our history, both before and after the flood. It is an intelligent being, and it's associated with the little people. It's associated with caves, and it can communicate. And portals it's associated with in, in the mythos. And it's the same mythos on on all continents, all cultures around the world, they all have a name for it, uh, whether it's Yeti or Bigfoot or Sasquatch, and may, believe me, there's many names, and who knows what we'll find on Antarctica, <laughs> so I can't <laughs> say for sure, but I'm presuming if there was civilization there, there would be some sort of recollection there as well, so this is one of, uh, it'd be what I would call part of the greater umbrella group of nephilim like creation but distinct mm. from a biblical pers perspective and by the way the giants were called bulls as well so when you get that word nephilim not only means giant tribe of giant but bully as well that's because they're the ones who received the divine right to rule and, and usurp the kingships and they were bullies and that's why we understand that term today coming from the violent nature, the perpetual war of, of the spurious offspring. And they're also known as tyrants. That's because that name was applied as Tyrannos to the Gyges kings after the flood, probably before the flood as well, and Gyges in its plural. And those were the Herculides dynasties in Syria and um um, also in Asia Minor and in Greece. And Herculides is part of the credigens of the spurious offspring, the descendants of Zeus, because Zeus had sex with a human female named Elkmeni, who produced Hercules as a demigod and was a giant. And then he created many dynastic bloodlines. And these Gyges kings were known as, and Gyges is singular, Gyges is the Greek word for giant. These people don't know that. <laughs> Gyges, uh, Gyges is the plural. So if you have like these uh, Gigantes, um, which were giant monsters created before the flood as well, and giant is connected to Gigantes, but through the plural. Um, and it's got to do with the the vowels following the G as you why you pronounce it a G or a Y. But those were uh, tyrant kings of the Hercule Herculi Herculides bloodline, um, and what it's why it's part of the Nephilim definition, <laughs> um, because it's important to understand that they're the royals, the kings of God, the Rex Deus, kings of God, and that's what they call themselves. And so when we look at um, these offspring that have been created, you have many different kinds that are not necessarily giants. And this would be with Bigfoot, one of them, just as little people are also offspring of the gods, the celestial mafia godfathers in many um, uh, cultures around the world. And Greek is the best ones where they actually describe it exactly as that of how these little people and there's four groups of elementals that they have three little ones and one a, a reptilian one that's called the salamanders so i'm just sort of laying sort of the, the the table here that there are multiple kinds of creations of the gods with humans and maybe with some dna manipulation that goes along with it um and the reason why I say that is a demigod, which is understood in the ancient cultures as the offspring of a god or a goddess and a human male or a human female, were 
50% God, 50% human. But when you get into the Sumerian tradition, like Gilgamesh after the flood versus Gilgamesh before the flood, two different giants by the same name, Book of Giants, Epic of Gilgamesh, two different accounts. Um, and Gilgamesh is considered two thirds God and one third human. Well, that's interesting. Now we see a split going on there. And uh, Gilgamesh is the offspring of the mother goddess Nin and his father, King Lugalbanda, uh, king of Uruk. And he's a post diluvian creation. Uh, and Enkidu is created the same way. And all of Utnapishtim or Zayazudra and other transliterated accounts of the Sumerian flood story, they're all two thirds God, one third human. And they're, it's not a human survival story that people would have you believe. It's a, whether it's true or not, it is a polytheist version of giants surviving the flood. And you have a second creation with Gilgamesh and Enkidu, all within the epic of Gilgamesh tales. And so it's this one-third, two-thirds thing. So there's seemingly maybe a, uh, something else going on. And Gilgamesh is a dark-haired giant and is larger than the red hair and the blonde-haired giants. Um, but that's another rabbit hole maybe for another day. <laughs> so, And then you have uh, the question is, how do fallen angels create offspring if they're spiritual beings? Yeah. And yet we know they have a physical form in polytheism and they walked amongst us and they ate and they touch and they did, they, you know, there's all of these accounts all around the world. The Bible says they're spirit beings, but we also know angels in the Bible can take a physical form as in Hebrews 13, for example, where we're told to be nice to strangers, lest we come across an angel unawares right. or the two angels that took a body form as did Jehovah of the Elohim, to go see Abraham, who Abraham didn't recognize at first as angels or Jehovah of the Elohim, but were just men, as he described them. But yet, when they went to Sodom, the two angels, they were also understood that they were recognized as angels in human form. So they could choose to be recognized as well. And they can make other forms. That's, that's a concept which goes sort of deep into the languages, but... Angels have the ability to create their own soul and body or their spirit. Bible tells us there's a spirit and there's a body and there's a soul. And the spirit comes from heaven. And that's a counterfeit spirit from the fallen angels that is done through this procreation. So if they can create a oikotarian, which is understood in Greek as the definition as the dwelling place for a spirit then they can create a place in this physical body for their spirit so that they can interact. That shows up in Jude 1, 6, when it's talking about the fallen angels who left their habitation in heaven. That word habitation is oiketarian. It's a dwelling place for their spirit being in heaven. There's an oiketarian in heaven, and there's an oiketarian on earth. There are two different dimensions. One's a spiritual realm, one's a physical realm. They can be here as spirit, or they can be here as body, and they can choose that body. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 is how it describes that we long for our house in heaven. And you're going to have variations of the word oiketarian, but specifically that house in heaven is oiketarian, and that we have a house on earth, and that we dwell for our house in heaven, our dwelling place for our spirit, where it comes from in heaven. And so they can create their own oikotarian. And when they do that, they create their own DNA, and then they pass on traits. So if you're a seraphim angel, serpent angel, you're going to produce offspring that looks like reptilians. And so most of the kings before the flood, and then shortly after the flood, were all represented around the world as serpents, just as most of the gods are represented as serpents or dragons. It's because they look just like them until they started to intermarry with humans after the flood um, because of a change that God put in place in Genesis 6-3 that they were going to go extinct unless they intermarried with humans. They started to lose some of those traits. So now if they can pass on that DNA... And if you're a cherubim and you have a lion face, you take a lion face on earth and you have sex with a human female, you might create the lion men of Moab. 
right? That's in the Bible. And so you can get different kinds of giants and different kinds of beings, but that different kind of being would probably have some sort of DNA manipulation. Now, how do I get there? Um, in the polytheist version, you have like centaurs, which are not a giant, but they have kind of this chimera type horse body with different kind of feet and different kind of tail than a horse would have and a human chest and head and they're the mentors for the giants both before and after the flood but they're created in a cloud by Hera so they created this being in a different way but there has to be some sort of sexual contact as a way to pass on that counterfeit spirit. So that suggests a technology is being used. So I would suggest some sort of technology and DNA manipulation that was being used for the little people and for Bigfoot. And one of the ways we get there biblically is that they had this technology uh, and that the technology to destroy the world by fire before the flood, which is why God permitted the flood um to, to occur so that that is reserved for the end time um and doesn't happen before and that they corrupted the whole world or i mean not the whole world they corrupted the earth in genesis 6 and genesis 7 that's the hebrew word shakath that means perverted decayed ruined uh words like that destroyed and that means everything on the earth that means the plant genomes and the dna except for what god called to go on the ark so, wow. yeah, and we understand that polytheism, both before and after the flood, is creating these chimera type of beings, multiple creatures as part of a, uh, and chimera is, is, the, is the DNA name for technology that they're using for DNA manipulation today, because they name everything after what happened before and after their gods. So, so right. yeah, so that's how, how you would get something like a Bigfoot. Uh, and in there's an interesting Gnostic uh, gospel called Pistis Sophia, and it shows parent gods before the flood, and one of them has the face of an ape in the dungeon. One of them has the face of a bear. Uh, so it could be one of those kinds of ones. So we don't know what all the angels different in the hierarchy look like. So one presumes in the many incursions of the giants both before and after the flood there was different orders of angels that were creating spurious beings we don't yeah we don't know whether we don't know whether bigfoot has changeling capabilities or not i've not seen anything on that there may be part of the record i've not seen it but other creatures in the elementals have changeling capabilities one of the things that is also uh, common amongst the giants, as in the Ugaritic text with the Raphaim, uh, in Greek mythology with the heroes and with the gods, in fairy mythology with the elementals, um, is that you have portals that they can go back and forth in between. So somehow their bodies are somewhat interdimensional, maybe not capable or permitted to go into heaven, but the ability to go through a portal um, and so many times the Bigfoot just sort of, as you say, they can't trace where it went. It either went through a dolmen that's around the world. That means a portal, D-O-L-M-E-N. People should look it up. They're everywhere around around the world, um, including at uh, Stonehenge. So a, a, a dolmen would be like two rocks uh, standing up with a capstone on it. It would create through their technology a portal through that doorway, so to speak. And so, mm -hmm. or through caves is the other way they th think that they have, there's some uh, domains and caves around the world where they might go into it. And it sort of fits in with all the other crazy, crazy things that go on the world, like uh, UAPs and UFOs coming through portals, interdimensional, fairies going, becoming interdimensional. The gods like Baal would go back and forth every day between Hades or Sheol, where the pit prison is also located, um, to, uh, oversee their, his, his, his kingdom as the chief of gods. And you have that cave at the foot of Mount Hermon, where the council of the gods rule from, uh, um, and it's called the gateway to Hades. <laughs> I mean, that's where Baal is said to have gone through every day, back and forth between the underworld and in the physical world. So, wow, man. Um, I know we're uh, probably pressed for time a bit here, but I got one more question I've been dying to ask you. You got time for that? Yep. 
All right. Yep. Genesis 10, 10, right? When we're trying to understand the origins and the access of evil, and we know the flood comes, wipes it, and we know that Nimrod comes and makes himself a gibberim, a gabor. Uh, in Genesis 10, 10, when it starts mentioning the cities of Nimrod, the fourth one, it, it, it's um, Kalne, C-A-L-N-E-H, in the land of Shinar. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on that? I, I researched it a little bit, and I found out, you know, they call Kalne the fortress of Anu, and um, one of the first places where the, like, flat earth and all this stems from. So I was just sort of want to throw that out there and see, you know, what, what your insights on Genesis 10.10 would be. Well, we need to sort of look at Nimrod as a very important figure. Uh, he is a son of Cush, so he has a genealogy. Uh, from a human and typically only Noahites are in the table of nations in Genesis 10 and first Chronicles. So all the descendants of Noah and they start the 70 nations or 70 patriarchs there, but there aren't any giants that are listed in there, but Nimrod is listed in there. And how do I know there aren't any, you know, the giants who started tribes aren't there. Rapha isn't listed for the Raphaim created by Baal and Anat after the flood. And the Rephaim tribe shows up in Genesis 14 and Genesis 15. Genesis 14 is the war of giants. Genesis 15 is the land being promised to Abraham by Jehovah of the Elohim. And you got Rephaim listed in territory between the Euphrates and the Nile River, and you get other giants in there as well, but that's a different rabbit hole. But uh, And Arba isn't in there as well, and in the book of Joshua, he's the patriarch for the Anakim giants. So just as a couple examples, Rephaim aren't listed in the flood. So when you get into, or aren't listed in the table of nations, because that's just for the Noahites. And you have to look at Deuteronomy 32 in that sort of light as well. So now you get nine patriarchless tribes listed amongst the Canaanites, which is really weird because Canaan is listed, son of Ham. Heth and Sidon, son of Canaan, are listed. And then you get 12 or nine families of Canaanites. And they're like the Amorites. They're like the Jebusites and all, and all nine, but they don't, you don't have a patriarch. And what's interesting about that is that word uh, families goes back into a Hebrew word that can mean a family, but a family is in a different species. So these don't have patriarchs because those are daughters of Canaan, daughters of Heth, daughters of Sidon that married Raphaim patriarchs to start those tribes. And they were named after the patriarchal giant. So their name isn't in there, just the tribe is listed so that we better understand everything that goes on in the land of the covenant, particularly in the war of giants in the time of the Exodus, when they're flushing out all of the giants uh, that were still living there uh, to, to, to take the land back that was apportioned to God. And so having said all of that, one more example so you understand Nimrod a little bit better. In Genesis 36, which is an add-on to the Table of Nations, you have the Dukes of Seir, where the Horim roamed, and the descendants of Esau went to and lived the monks. And Esau intermarried with Ohalibama, which is a female Horim giant. And Eliphaz married um, Timna, which was the daughter of the chief Duke of Seir, Seir himself, who Mount Seir is named after, a Horim, as he's described, and a giant, and, and Horim are giants in Deuteronomy 2, Hebrew Rapha for Raphaim in the plural versus Nephilim, so a post diluvian giant. And you created these new dynasties, but because you have descendants of the Amalekites that show up that are going to attack Israel as soon as they move out of uh, Egypt, you have to have context of where they come from. So that's why you get that intermarriage, but it's not part of the table of nations, but it's a powerful hybrid nation, but distinct from the Amalekim that are in the War of Giants in Genesis 14, because the Amalekim predate the Amalekite hybrid nation that is going to be in the Mount Seir region and, um, and live amongst the Amalekites. 
uh, the Malachim, um, they they come along a couple hundred years afterwards with the creation. So you've got two different tribes that are talked about, and you don't have that as a patriarch of a descendant of Isaac, you know, through Abraham creating this nation. They're not listed in the table of nations. So Nimrod, he doesn't have any descendants listed. Mm-hmm. And part of his transformation is, is he's going to intermarry with the um, giants that are in Mesopotamia, ones like Gilgamesh. And that's why Nimrod's is also depicted similar to, to Gilgamesh. Uh, and that he's going to start hybrid bloodlines as well and, and kingship dynasties. And that he becomes a gibbering. He's not Raphaim. He's not Nephilim. He becomes, which is the Hebrew word Chalal, which is through uh, ritual undertaking and breaking of vows. So he turns against God, whether or not he receives antediluvian knowledge in the Gnostics account uh, and somehow becomes bigger and stronger through maybe DNA manipulation that we were talking about and enhanced. We don't know, but he becomes like a gibberim. Gibberim is used to describe giants, but not always. It's used 154 times in the, in the Old Testament, not always to describe a giant. It can describe a human. It can describe the power of God or the power of angels. So you have to look at the application as into, into the meaning as, as to whether or not he's saying he's a giant, but he certainly acted like a giant and he introduced the Babylon religion. So it gives us the context that we need for his Babel empire, where he's an archetype antichrist with the original Babel religion after the flood imposed onto humans, which is going to be the same religion that shows up in the end time that we call Babylon um, that the woman writes. Wow. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, huh? Nothing new under the sun.